Uh, my name is Mark Eggett. I chair the Committee for Yiddish. And this morning at 7.30, I had a call from Mark Kaplan from the airport saying they won't let me on the flight. Uh, so there, there's no doubt very good reasons for that. Uh, I should speak louder? Yes. Okay. Seven, seven o'clock this morning, 7.30, I got a call from a Kaplan saying uh, they won't let him on the flight. And so uh, they have very good reasons for this, of course. Uh, but with, with the amazing work of uh, Anastasia Lewis and uh, Anna Sternsis, somehow this happened. Now, this could not happen in Nancy's time. So, uh, so this is happening, and it, it's, it's, it's shockingly wonderful. And so let me begin by introducing Anastasia, who will introduce the speaker. Thanks, Mark. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, OK. <laughs> I'll be loud. Um, so my name is Anastasia Lewis. Um, as Mark has mentioned, uh, we have been uh, working really hard to make this lecture happen. Um, it is my great honor and pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Mark Kaplan, who is speaking today um, with the support of the Committee for Yiddish. Um, his talk is also co-sponsored by the Center and Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Mark Kaplan uh, is a native of Louisiana and a graduate of uh, Yale University. He is currently um, a visiting professor in the Tauber Department of Judaic Studies at the University of Wrocław in Poland. He has held professorial um, and research appointments at Indiana University, the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard University, Johns Hopkins University, and the Center for Jewish History in New York, as well as the University of Michigan and Yale University. His first book, um, which was out from Stanford University Press in 2011, is called How Strange the Change language, temporality, and narrative form in peripheral modernisms. It compares the 19th century Yiddish literature and the 20th century Anglophone and Francophone African literatures. His next book, Yiddish Writers in Weimar Berlin, A Fugitive Modernism, is forthcoming from Indiana University Press in fall of 2020. Um, on a more personal note, um, I just want to mention that I, Mark Kaplan um, has been my mentor. I had um, an enormous pleasure to learn Yiddish from him um, at uh, Yivo University uh, in New York and at uh, Naomi Prower Kadar program um, in uh, Tel Aviv um, uh, University in Israel. Um, so, with great uh, pleasure, um, I introduce uh, Dr. Mark Kaplan, who is going to speak to us um, on the topic of a disenchanted Elijah, conspiracy, allegory, and the crisis of East European Jewry in Ansky's uh, Horton Galicia, the destruction of Galicia, Galicia uh, 1920. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everyone can hear me? The sound is good? Okay. The first thing I want to do is I want to stand up and uh, confirm to everyone I am wearing pants. I think that that's very important, you know, when you're sitting behind a desk that you let everybody know. I'm taking this very seriously, you know, I've come fully dressed for the occasion. Uh, I want to thank uh, Anastasia, uh, Lubas and uh, Mark Egret and uh, uh, Anya Stanchis for making this talk possible. And I want to tell you a little bit about why we're having to do this in such an outlandish, uh, technologically sophisticated format. Uh, 
we live in an era of postmodernism. And what that means ultimately is a conflict in our experience of time and our experience of history. However much our technologies connect us globally so that I can be in a room in Baltimore, Maryland, and you can be in a lecture hall in Toronto, um, we are nonetheless constrained by nationalisms, by borders, uh, by ruling governments, and my predicament is uh, strangely comparable to the predicament that Ansky uh, describes. Even though, fortunately for us, my predicament does not actually involve risking my life as it did for Ansky and for the people that he writes about. But as uh, Anastasia mentioned, I'm teaching this year at the University of Wrocław in Poland. And for that uh, uh, position, I have to have a work visa through the Polish consulate in Washington, D.C. I applied for the visa on February the 12th with the assurance that my passport would be returned in time for me to catch the plane this morning on February the 23rd. And the funny thing about that is my passport has not been returned. So I am still in Baltimore for that reason. It uh, resonates in an interesting way with some of the themes that I'm going to touch on today in my prepared remarks. Even though, as I say, uh, uh, fortunately, I didn't have to involve the physical dangers uh, or the monumental destruction that Anski describes in his narrative. Everyone is still able to hear me, yes? Yes. I'm going to start my uh, PowerPoint now. Everybody can see me? Yes. And everybody can see the PowerPoint? Yes. Then let me begin my formal remarks by saying that it is fitting that Shin Anski, the author to whom my remarks today are dedicated, is the first of only three subjects in Yiddish literary history that have to date received a scholarly biography in English. His life was genuinely heroic on a level that one doesn't usually expect of any writer, let alone a Yiddish one. From a traditional Jewish upbringing in the Tsarist Pale of Settlement that produced virtually every Yiddish writer of note, to an educator and organizer among miners in the Russian interior, to an exiled activist for the Socialist Revolutionary, or SR Party, to the major collector and ethnographer of Jewish folklore in the early 20th century, to a relief worker for Jews stranded between the Russian and Austrian empires during World War I, to an exile for the SRs again following the Bolshevik Revolution. Ansky's life, overshadows all but two of his literary works. His drama, Dead Dibbik, the best and most famous play ever written in Yiddish, and Chorm Galitzia, the destruction of Galitzia, published in a 2002 translation as The Enemy at His Pleasure. This narrative documents his ambiguous and shape-shifting role in the Russian war effort on behalf of Jews caught in its path. My presentation today is excerpted from a book that I've just finished writing about Yiddish literature produced in Berlin during the Weimar Republic, that is, the interwar era after World War I, compared with contemporaneous German language literature, critical theory, music, and film. Rather than providing a social history of East European Jewish refugees living in Berlin during the 1920s, an important topic already well documented in English and German language scholarly sources, my research aims to continue an investigation I began in my first book, a comparison of Yiddish and African literatures dealing with the poetics of the periphery. Now, Eastern Europe exemplifies many of the aspects of what I mean when I describe the periphery to which my work is dedicated. 
But Berlin also functions as a periphery for the Yiddish modernists I am considering. In particular, David Bergelson, Dan Nister, and Moish Bikolba. But no less significantly, the German Jewish figures with whom I am comparing this Yiddish avant garde. Josef Roth, who stands at a crossroads between Yiddish speaking Eastern Europe and the German avant garde, formulates the marginality of Weimar era Berlin by writing in 1926, As much as Berlin lies on the outskirts of the radically transforming Eastern European societies that preoccupy the Yiddish writers I consider, it also stands for the German intelligentsia of the era as a periphery on the margins of more glamorous metropolises such as Paris, Leningrad and Moscow, New York, and above all, Hollywood. Though located ostensibly in interwar Berlin, my research is equally preoccupied with the dislocations affecting Eastern Europe during this period. And that is why Ansky's borderland travel law provides such an illustrative preamble to my comparison of Yiddish and German Jewish literatures in the interwar period. As Larry Wolf's 1994 study, Inventing Eastern Europe, documents, the concept of Eastern Europe has been at least as much a temporal or historical category as it is a geographical one. In the history of European modernity, the East functions as a geographical figure for the West's other that manifests itself linguistically, culturally, and in various senses, racially. Both German Jewish and Eastern European Jews throughout the modern era embraced these rhetorical designations so that German Jews over successive generations saw in the East a repository of authentic, even primeval Jewishness that their urban and bourgeois parents had abandoned, while Eastern Jews over the course of the 19th century recognized that the successful assimilation of modernity required not just an abandonment of Jewish traditions, but also the adoption of Western typically German linguistic, intellectual, and cultural standards. In the first modern Yiddish novel, Yisrael Axenfeld's Das Sterntel, The Headband, first published in 1861, a journey from the Pale of Settlement to Prussian Breslau, now my home city of Wrocław, signifies a temporal shift from an almost medieval and nearly all Jewish shtetl to a modern cosmopolitan genteel metropolis. By the time of the First World War, these stereotypical, though rhetorically vivid oppositions of West and East were broken by a conflict that destroyed and remade East and West in equal measure. In the aftermath of the war, Eastern European territories that had previously been subsumed within the large, relatively stable, generally peaceful Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires had been reformulated as new nation states such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, while to the east, the Soviet Union counted as a new experiment in social and national organization that transformed what it seemed the most backward culture in Europe into what appeared at the time to be the most forward-thinking society on earth. For all the figures in my comparison, the transformation of Eastern Europe is the primary political and philosophical event in their consciousness, whether in the example of the Soviet Union, to which most of the writers in my work are attracted, the Yiddish avant-garde fatally so, or in the contrary recrudescence of ethnic nationalism in the new nation states formed between Russia and Germany. 
which stood as cautionary examples of the failure of modernity and enlightenment to conquer the prejudices and provincialism that nearly every Jewish modernist had been dedicated to resisting. Given the temporal contradictions that these territories signified during the first three decades of the 20th century, the rhetorical figuration and transfiguration of Eastern Europe emerges as a primary theme connecting the individual writers and theorists in my comparison. There are two predominant discourses that I have found illustrative of these contradictions, as well as the corresponding peripheralities of German-Jewish and Berlin-Yiddishist literatures during the interwar period. These discourses are travel writing, and the fantastic allegory. Although these respective literary forms seem to stand at opposite ends of a spectrum of representation, they share a common rejection of the realist principle of interior consciousness that constitutes the fundamental literary representation of a 19th century modernity, the realist novel. They also resemble one another in their construction of common narrative paradoxes. Travel literature subverts its own claims to verisimilitude by taking the least qualified perspective on an unfamiliar land or society, a stranger's perspective, as the basis for its observations of that literary space. Travel literature typically bespeaks a temporal disconnection between the narrator and the place described, an absence of historical synchronicity between the narrating subject and the object of narration that functions allegorically by rendering the types encountered in the foreign culture as rhetorical figures that characterize the landscape and its inhabitants. All Travel writing depicts an effort at domesticating the foreign by rendering it at least rhetorically understandable. All successful travel writing dramatizes this effort as a failure. An important part of the relationship I am contemplating between travel writing and allegory and their consequent significance for what I'm calling peripheral modernisms is based on their common connections to an experience of dislocation and an aesthetic of dissipation. My concept of allegory derives from the elaboration that Walter Benjamin initiates in his 1928 study, The Origin of German Tragic Drama. Allegory is a mode of figuration caught between polarities of metaphor and metonymy. It thus remains caught between metaphysics and materialism. As the poetics of broken, stillborn, or defunct metaphors, allegory replaces the kinetic energy of metaphorical or metonymic relationships with the static electricity of abstract thought clinging to the language of poetry or the poetics of fiction. In this obsolescence, however, it provides an ideal poetics for the periphery because allegory functions as the intrusion of a superseded time frame to the present, as when, for example, Anski records legends about the founding of Hasidism in his Chronicle of World War I, and uses these legends to trace an itinerary of devastation. We will return to this topic. Allegory characterizes a work of literature that is caught between or among territories, temporalities, and languages, just as modern Yiddish literature inevitably is. My discussion of the destruction of Galicia today 
thus figures in the introduction of my work as a preliminary chapter on the encounter between Yiddish, Eastern European, semi-traditional Jewish life, and the destructive modernity on the Austrian and Russian borderlands during World War I. The paradox that motivates and animates the destruction of Galicia is the struggle of the author, Anski, trying to shape the narrative, but caught at the same time participating in the events he describes. Where his play, Dead Divin, had disguised authorial invention as folklore, the destruction of Galicia dissolves the author's role through several strategies Anski had adapted from folklore. In particular, his understanding that folklore preserves the pre-rational character of collective myths is now applied politically and historically to narratives that circulate about Jews and the territories between the Austrian and Russian empires. The role of history distinguishes, distinguishes these narratives from the folklore that Anski had collected before World War I. In folklore, the coexistence of contradictions can be reconciled because folklore permits these states of being to interact. By contrast, the narratives accusing Jews in supernatural terms of undermining the Russian war effort underscore the contradictory condition of the war and its victims because the material conditions that call these narratives into being can never be evaded or transcended. The destruction of Galicia as a narrative stands at a fault line among journalism, ethnography, and propaganda, as much as it documents the destruction of Jewish communities at the borderlands between the Russian and Austrian empires, constantly trespassing boundary lines that are established, erased, and redrawn throughout the war. At the same time, though the only one of Anski's major works to have been published exclusively in Yiddish, The Destruction of, of Galicia, is below its monolingual surface, a narrative in constant flux among Yiddish, Russian, and German, all of which Anski spoke, surrounded by Polish, Hungarian, and Romanian, none of which Anski understood. Horben Galicia is therefore what the French theorists Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari's minor literature, what they call the minor literature, operating in reverse. Not a Russian work that is a major language subverted through Yiddish, the minor language, but a Yiddish work depleted of its idiomatic resources by the author's dependence on Russian. In a methodological inversion comparable to this linguistic reversal, where the objective of Anski's earlier ethnography had been to record folklore, what ruptures the reportorial narrative of this book is another kind of legendary discourse the conspiracy theory. Although the destruction of Galicia is recognizably of a piece with Anski's previous and more celebrated ethnographic research, it also signifies a decisive break from his earlier efforts, which aligns this work simultaneously with the problems of travel literature and also with the political position of a modern literature that in aesthetic respects, the didactically realistic Anski would have been reluctant to identify with. Where Anski's previous ethnographic research aspired to a synthetic composite of Eastern European Jewish folk culture, the culminating fruits of which can be observed in that divic, the destruction of Galicia is structured around his itinerary from village to shtetl to city along the endlessly fluctuating border of the Russian war effort. As a distinct space, Galicia 
had functioned throughout the 19th century as a half-Asiatic territory between a civilized Europe and a barbaric Russia. But what Anski dramatizes in his travel memoir is the erasure of borders between Russia and Austria, as well as the erasure of distinction between civilization and barbarism, or life and death. The ethnographic impulse that inspired Florida Galicia cannot be maintained over its long narrative because the author cannot remain distinct from the victims whose plight he records. And the anxiety this erasure provokes results in the narrative failure that makes travel literature such a significant genre. In this sense, one can compare the destruction of Galicia with a more formally modernist work, Isaac Babel's Red Cavalry, written in 1926, which similarly depicts a Jewish protagonist caught between a Russian occupying army and the Jews living desperately under that occupation. Red Cavalry, however, ultimately dramatizes its protagonist's fraught process of identification with the Red Army, whereas Anski's earlier account remains identified exclusively with the Tsarist Army's victims. In this sense, it is the more peripheral of the two works, and this signifies what can be identified as the work's modernism, its critique of modernity in situational terms, if not necessarily in aesthetic ones. What I'm going to try to do now is to identify the components of the narrative that function in aesthetically modernist terms, and what can be learned about history, about rhetoric, and about Eastern European Jewish culture from their construction in this work. The paradoxes that propel the narrative become clear in the first sentence. Bald wie der Weltkrieg hat ausgebrochen, nach dem kurzen Moment von dem halb ernsten, halb gemachten jüdischen Patriotism, beschoss Rebonnen haben sich gehaus mit Kurschkewitschen und Petersburger Jeden sind gestanden auf die Knie von einem Denkmal von dem ersten Säuger Jeden, Alexander dem Dritten, und gesungen Kael Mole Rachami haben sich stürmiert, angerückt auf, haben stürmi, stürmisch angerückt auf dem Jedentum zum Teuren, Russland und der okkupierte Galizia finstere Wolken von die schrecklichsten Bilbolen und Verfolgungen. Although Anski reiterates familiar themes of resentment, toward bourgeois Jews and religious leaders for making common cause with their Russian oppressors. This rhetorical gesture distracts from the fact that Konsky himself is also making a strategic alliance with Russian bureaucrats, as well as Jewish communal and religious leaders in his expedition to provide relief for the poor and powerless Jews with whom he identifies. Ansky owes his presence in the war effort and the existence of this narrative to the financial and institutional support of the groups whom he mocks at the beginning of his account. More fundamentally, however, Ansky owes the existence of this report to the internal contradictions of his own position as a political radical and official representative of Russian relief agencies. The author served semi-officially in the government he wished to overthrow, in territories caught in a struggle among two warring powers, the Austrian and the Tsarist empires, neither of which he identified with. As much as Anski both underscores and evades the contradictions of his position as observer, participant, and reporter of the war relief effort, he introduces a specter of rhetorical violence that becomes an instrumental precursor to the physical violence that the Russian army incites and perpetrates against Jews in their path. These libels, 
recycled traditional themes of Jews as betrayers, connivers, exploiters of the non-Jewish population. But in the anti-traditional context of the World War, these slanders had been transformed into conspiracy theories. To understand the significance of conspiracy theories and the relevance of understanding them is sadly pertinent in the current political climate. One must first differentiate them from conspiracies, a category of social experience. In spite of their similar vocabularies, conspiracies and conspiracy theories are opposites. Conspiracies are specific, concentrated efforts where conspiracy theories invoke vast, limitless, though always hidden resources. Conspiracy theories are a story genre formulated to explain global events through seemingly rational analysis that in fact offers superficial cover for irrational, mythical thinking. The destruction of Galicia documents the role of conspiracy theories in fueling the anti-Semitic violence of the Russian army during World War I. To understand the significance of these stories, it is worth considering the characteristics that connect conspiracy theories with folk tales on a formal level, yet distinguish each from the other on a temporal level. Both folk tales and conspiracy theories serve as explanatory narratives. Both function at a border between orality and literacy. The conspiracy theory, however, belongs to an era of unstable social relations and new technologies. Witness their recrudescence in the early days of the internet and their current proliferation on Twitter and other social media. The conspiracy theories depend on new technologies for their circulation, but they respond with suspicion towards symbols of disruption, power, and invisible omniscience that these technologies portend. As Ansky writes, Angeheim hat man mit stiller Hills, Messieres und Bilbollen, noch habt ihr hat den Ziel, ein Reis zu stellen, die jeden, die jeden Verräter gegen Russland und dabei unterzustreichen die Übergegebenheit und Dreischaft von die Polyaken. Man hat Gerechiles, als wenn die Deutschen oder Estreicher kommen in eine Stadt oder eine Städte, beziehen sich die Jeden zu sehen mit der größten Freundschaft, liefern sie Produkte, ändern auf alle ihre Fragen. Jeden dienen dem Feind als Spione, sie sind verbunden mit ihm durch Lichtsimone, durch Sreifes, schicken ihm erüber Millionen Gold und so weiter. These conspiracy theories provide a commentary on the function of technology as an agent of dislocation, control, and unseen ubiquity. With respect to the role of the Jews in the imagination of conspiracy theorists, a Russian officer on the train tells Ansky's narrator, Alle falsche Ideas versprechen nur Jesus. The Kievan haben sie gelost a clown as the Deutschen haben genommen Kelts. Und die Chutzbezehre schreien offen, Baldam kommen unsere, das heißt die Deutschen. Und zwischen sich rennen sie auf Deutsch. Gedarf sie allen in der Welt. Jews function in this description as a phantasm, so that even their language, which at the border of Galicia might indeed be unstable, between pale settlement Yiddish and Austrian German is an expression of their disloyalty. The Jews, in fact, possess no loyalties in the mind of their accusers, only multiple disloyalties. This is the crisis that the book documents without ever depicting it directly. Power 
is the one language that Jews, including the narrator, are incapable of speaking or understanding. Of all the conspiracy theories that Ansky documents, none is more pervasive than the Jewish girl in the window. The story first appears at the beginning of the war when Cossacks invade the Galician border town of Brog. Noch eider ich bin gekommen in Brod, habe ich schon gehört in die militärische Kreise, dem offiziellen Nusser von der Geschehenisch. Wenn die erste Kosaken Abteilung ist ein reiner Stopp, hat ein jüdisch Mädel, die Tochter von einem Hotel Eigentümer, euch geschossen von Fenster von Hotel und geharget dem Kosaken Offizier. Die Kosaken haben an den Ort geharget das Mädel, haben bombardiert die Stadt und haben verbrennt den ganzen Karal, wo der Anfall ist vorgekommen. So Ansky quotes testimony that the daughter of a Jewish hotelier in Brody had fled the hotel in a panic when she heard the shot that had wounded or killed the Russian soldier. The persistence of the legend depends as much on the suggestiveness of its narrative premise as the putative occurrence of the incident itself. The hotel, as a modern meeting place and ostensible safe haven, magnifies the treachery of the girl's supposed violence. The family of the hotelier stands for the danger that Jews represent in the anti-Semitic imagination in that they pose as welcoming neighbors, but conceal murderous betrayal beneath the facade of friendliness. The erotic insinuation of a Jewish girl at once wanton and virginal magnifies the sense of danger, destructiveness, and foreignness implicit among Jews as inassimilable strangers, indistinguishably embedded in the native landscape of an eternal border. Nonetheless, what accounts for Russian defeat isn't a mythical Jewish treachery. The worst traitors reportedly are the Poles. But airborne reconnaissance, the ubiquitous omniscience ascribed to Jews, is only a displacement of the enemy's technological superiority. Similarly, as a Russian surgeon explains to the narrator, the fact that Jews, unlike many of their persecutors, are literate and familiar with the local landscape is sufficient to arouse suspicion against them. In any circumstance where knowledge stands in opposition to power, knowledge becomes subversive and the knowledgeable become perceived as enemies. In this context, the Jewish maid signifies the allure, danger, and treachery of modern technology in its enticing and threatening aspects. In a corresponding gesture, the narrator crafts an image that synthesizes the ethnic diversity and disunity of the European battlefield and links this dispersal to the violence against Jews that constitutes its most virulent consequence. These homeless people by tens and hundreds of thousands, will come into the interior and spread across the endless fields of greater Russia, Ukraine, and Siberia. And all these former antagonists and deadly enemies will come together on those endless fields and work solemnly by the sweat of their brows. They'll till the same soil, eat from the same bowl, drink from the same pitcher, express their deep gloom and yearning with the same universal sigh. And as they grow even closer and discuss things openly, they'll find so many universal interests, universal joys and sorrows. And when they remember their neighbor, the Jew, who fought none of them, they will nevertheless unanimously agree that the Jew is the one responsible for everybody's misfortune. This passage parodies the Tolstoyan idealism that had in part inspired Ansky's political activism 30 years earlier. 
The bitterness of wartime violence has eaten away at his previous conviction, as much as it has destroyed the shaky relationship between Jews and non-Jews, and severed the continuity that each group had maintained with its own past. Nonetheless, at the very end of his narrative, Anski writes, Nira shine ice to comment at la hamal to constatir as eine kagolitiane yid, geplotte und ruinierte durch den russischen Militär, haben sich abgerufen mit Anziehung wegen Charakter von einem russischen Menschen und gebracht Fakten, wo ein russischer Soldat oder Offizier hat ein Reuss gewesen an Idealism, in der Menschlichkeit. This populist belief that Russian folk culture could be elevated above the corrupt czarist system that had called it into being, the evil of which would require no documentation for a Yiddish readership, and to which Ansky had devoted his entire life to overthrowing, seems at the end of this narrative as much a folk tale as the libels about Jews secretly telephoning the Kaiser from basement telephones in Shtetlov without electricity. The testimony of Russian benevolence shares with the conspiracy theories that preceded the quality of a secret history that inverts the reality otherwise observable throughout this account. Ansky deflates the utopian belief in the Russian army's generosity by reducing it to another embedded testimony out of place in the chronicle of destruction that surrounds it. And yet, these testimonials also precede accounts of German atrocities, specifically the decision of German military to prevent a cholera epidemic among its ranks by placing Jewish cholera patients in a barn, which they then set on fire. Ansky contrasts the sadism of Cossack troops with the methodical barbarism of the Germans, for whom the ends of self-preservation always justify even inhuman means. As Ansky writes, I don't know what is crueler, torching a barrack filled with sick people, or making people strip naked, ride on pigs, and gunning them down. The barrack fire, no matter how inhumane, at least had a specific goal. With Germans, you knew who you were dealing with, but with the Russians, you were never sure of your life or your dignity. Although Ansky suggests that German rationality is defensible, the action he cites undermines his allegiance to such rationalism. In this juxtaposition, Ansky articulates the modernism of a peripheral predicament in which Jews are caught hopelessly between both systems of power, neither of which protects their rights, even their right to exist. Inevitably, Jews concoct their own conspiracy theories in response to the violence of their circumstances, and Anski records these legends as well. In Zamoch, the Poles informed on the Jews for aiding the enemy. Several Jews were arrested, but a Russian teacher and a civil judge presented themselves to the judges and, falling on bended knee, asked that no verdict be delivered until their testimony was heard. If you want to know who is truly guilty, they said, come with us. When they were followed to the cellar of the Countess Zamyoshka, they found a whole group of Jews in caftans and yarmulkes with long sidewalks speaking on telephones to the Austrians. The Russian judge shouted, take them in for questioning. And when the Jews were taken in for questioning, it was revealed that they were all Poles who had dressed up in Jewish clothing so as to cast aspersion on the Jews. Ansky reports variants of the Zamoch tale from Minsk and from Lublin. The circulation of these tales, whether condemning or exonerating the Jews, creates a symbolic geography that parallels the larger processes of destructive mobility that warfare brings about. Though the immobility of Jews caught 
among shifting borders and warring armies puts their life in danger. The circulation of stories about Jews contrasts the physical entrapment of Jews, however incommensurately, with a metaphysical hypermobility. This strategy of figurative geography is a technique that Ansky's writing shares with the Volkstimmliche Geschichten, the stories in a folk-like vein of Y.L. Pettis, who was the primary Yiddish language influence on Ansky's writing, and who plays a role in Ansky's travelogue through Poland. Perhaps coincidentally, Pettis was a native of Zamosh, where the conspiracy theory of the Poles disguised as Jews originated. More purposefully, the fictive marking of territory achieved by setting legendary stories in actual locations is a device that Pagets had learned from Polish literature, invested as Pagets Yiddish writing was in imagining a cultural nationhood for a people lacking political self-determination. In this respect, Anski has recorded a story of Poles disguised as Jews to invert lessons he had learned from Peretz, a Yiddish writer who had masqueraded as a Pole. Anski, who shares a grave in Warsaw with Peretz, learned other techniques from Peretz as well. Just as Peretz had fabricated Hasidic fables to convey an ironic and cosmopolitan critique of tradition and modernity simultaneously. Anski uses embedded Hasidic parables in the narrative to destabilize and disintegrate the authorial voice, diffusing it into the collective for which Anski speaks. But if Pagetz's motivation in imitating and reimagining Jewish folklore by situating it in a recognizable Polish landscape had been to create a Jewish nation, however imaginatively. Anski's figurative geography reflects the disillusion of this imaginary Jewish space. Where Pagetz's refashioning of folklore illustrates both a political and aesthetic use value for symbolic thinking. Anski's documentation of conspiracy theories demonstrates the breakdown of the symbol's represent representational power. Motifs such as the Jewish girl in the hotel window in this, re in this respect function not as symbols but as metonymy and what non-Jewish conspiracy theorists construct between these rep representational strategies is allegory. Allegorical discourse can be characterized as a mode of figura figuration that couples imagistic language with conceptual terms, in contrast to other forms of metaphor that, as my teacher Benjamin Harshav, a blessed memory, has written, juxtaposed two species of, quote, concrete universals, such as, in Harshaw's discussion, the evening sky and a patient etherized on a table in T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Though Harshaw recognizes that in metaphor, the juxtaposed elements represent something beyond them, such as, for example, the modern hospital and ruminations about death beyond Prufrock's twilight contemplation of the sunset. In allegory, the traffic between image and concept remains at a standstill, and this stasis allows the contradictions of history and ideology motivating the act of representation to be understood. Allegory manifests itself in Ansky's narrative via the symbolic value accorded Jews and other scapegoats in the conspiracy theories that intercut the narrative, and also in the use of territoriality as a means not of locating, but dislocating the narrator, and as well in the status of the human body as an object and agent of destruction. 
This final aspect of allegorical figuration serves to articulate its significance for the narrative as a whole. If metaphor and metonymy propose a constructive relationship between or among images, allegory proposes both a destructive juxtaposition and a deconstructive juxtaposition. For example, Anski describes a fatally injured officer. The dying officer's skeletal delirium serves both as an allegorical figure and a figure for allegory. Its association with death and dysfunction is a signal characteristic of allegory that serves in part to distinguish it from other modes of figurative representation. Similarly, the fact that a dying man narrates an account of death underscores the impression of a talking corpse and a living death. The temporal impossibilities to which allegory gives voice by underscoring the contradictions out of which it emerges. Moreover, allegory functions simultaneously as an illustration of displacement, as well as a conceptual internalization of this displacement within the discourse of the narrative. Thus, the narrator, in one of the most moving episodes of the entire work, records the testimony of a woman from Demnix who has taken refuge in Tarnov. After dispassionately describing the murder of her children and grandchildren, through the series of bombings and pogroms befalling her hometown, she suddenly breaks her monotone to bewail the desecration of Taurus scrolls and the slaughter of horses during the same sequence of atrocities. Caught between the physical violence of the pogrom and the mechanized violence of the bombing, this refugee equates the fate of her children simultaneously, but only implicitly, with the slaughter of helpless animals and the destruction of sacred objects. Her ability to bemoan the fate of horses and Taurus scrolls instead of her own offspring affects the reader not because the loss of these animals or artifacts is commensurate with the murder of her family members, but precisely because it is not. The inadequacy of representational language that allegory enacts is, paradoxically, the only form of representation that does justice to the unspeakable. As is necessarily the case in travel writing, setting amplifies the allegorical function of these descriptions. And therefore, it is significant that the most graphic description of violence in the narrative takes place on a train. Already in the decade preceding the war, Anski's contemporary Shalom Aleichem had, in a series of fictive travel vignettes collected as the railroad stories, been able to transfer the, conv the conventions of Yiddish satire from the shtetl to the third-class railway car that conveyed Jews throughout the Pale of Settlement, where in 19th century Yiddish satire, the role of travel had been reserved mostly for exceptional, authorial figures, such as Sholem Aleichem or his predecessor, Mendel Avoy Kasparim. At the beginning of the 20th century, dislocation had become the common fate for everyone in the Yiddish world. In World War I, Anski found it necessary to describe how even this portable shtetl had become consumed in the conflagration, so that not only the simulated home of the Jewish exile, but also the modern technologies that had been promoted as a deliverance from the dysfunctionality of tradition 
were equally dead ends to the Jews consigned to them. Indeed, more than merely deciphering the inscrutable and shifting borders between the Russian and Austrian empires, or the many individuals whom the narrator encounters as further examples of allegorical representation, the narrator himself takes on an allegorical function, a figuration of the role Ansky had played in actuality. In this respect, he masquerades a Christian with Vilchinsky, the so-called pro-Jewish head of the Civic Commission, who confesses his actual hatred toward the Jews. At issue in their discussion is the question of setting up a soup kitchen, as opposed to dispensing groceries directly to Jews and peasants, a dilemma that reiterates the central political dilemma of Ansky's position, to integrate with the non-Jews or to remain autonomous. This problem of integrating Jews into a larger war and relief effort, or protecting their unique interests and preserving their ethnic distinctions, informs the destruction of Galicia as a narrative and connects this work to larger dilemmas that motivated Ansky's career as a whole. In a sense, this irresolvable conflict is the dialectic on which the work as a whole is premised. The narrator's mutability and mercurial temperament, as well as his single-minded benevolence toward the powerless Jewish community, comes to resonate with another legend from traditional Jewish folklore, the immortally roving figure of Elijah the prophet, reconfigured in disenchanted and historicized, which is to say allegorized form. Ansky writes of the shtetl Torskin, for example, Muzot as epis in a door, hot zech bazetz a yiddisher of its seer, on vosfer a yid as fort nish door stout er off, frecht von ander, on a yiddish, on the kabid, mit te, git die kinder, confect me, on tail gelt. There it is, baseman nish. Though Ansky's narrator is aware of the irony this passage cultivates, the native informant whom he quotes is not. In his ubiquity and indecipherability, the narrator has become the protagonist of a new legend, the benign counterpart to the Jewish girl in the window. In the folk tradition, Elijah the prophet, like Ansky's narrator, plays a variety of roles, tester of the faithful, harbinger of redemption, benefactor of the poor, the sick, the aged, and small children, both to substitute for the fractured wholeness of the exiled Jewish people and to mend the tatters of the communal fabric. Ansky, however, serves as a disenchanted Elijah who can only further chronicle his community's destruction. At the end of his narrative, Ansky returns to another semi-legendary figure, the Baal Shem Tov, to summarize the devastation that he has witnessed in Chronicle, describing the failure of a Hasidic rabbi to salvage two letters signed by the Baal Shem Tov in 1753. Ansky indicates that when the letters had been recovered from their hiding place, the Baal Shem Tov's signature had been erased from them whether by the ravages of the East European climate or by divine decree. This calls to mind a memory of shattered tablets of the Ten Commandments that he had found in a desecrated synagogue. These two symbols, shattered tablets and flying letters, summed up the life of the Galician Jews. During my first tour of Galicia, I found people who were shattered tablets with blood pouring from every break. The catastrophe striding the ruined, bloody, and degraded populace was huge, almost epic. But in its vast scope, there was a severe beauty that transformed these human sorrows, sufferings, to an epic tragedy. Now, while traveling through the intact towns and townlets, I 
no longer encountered the earlier sublime and beautiful drama. The heroes of the national tragedy had become professional beggars. And all these living corpses trudged past me, not as shattered tablets, but as tablets from which the letters had been erased. The phrases shattered tablets and flying letters reference in Hebrew in the original allude to Moses' shattering of the tablets at Mount Sinai in response to the Israelites' worship of the golden calf, and also to Rabbi Hanina ben Tardion, whom Roman authorities martyred by setting him on fire with a Torah scroll wrapped around his body. At the moment of immolation, he declared to his disciples that he could see the letters of the law soaring upward. With these allusions, Anski associates the destruction of Eastern European Jewish life with the two great cataclysmic events, the rupture between God and the Israelites in the desert and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem that had destroyed the mythical unity of the ancient Jewish people, thereby plunging them into the wilderness of history and exile. Like the letters of the Baal Shem Tov, the bodies of Jewish refugees have become effaced texts, a community whose tradition has been blotted out by the forces of history. Where previously Anski had used folklore to salvage the spoken wisdom of the Jewish folk, but also to signify his own renewed identification with the Jewish people, now folkloric motifs figure the dissipation of Jewish peoplehood, physically as well as spiritually. In the destruction of Galicia, Anski's strategic and dramatic decision to dissipate into his own narrative, to merge with the embedded voices he records, signals not only his commitment to identify with the Jewish people, but to suffer their fate with them as well. A chain of not. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this exquisite talk about the Shin Anski's uh, Disenchanted Elijah, the Destruction of Galicia. Um, we'll open the floor to questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask so, you to moderate us, uh, 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 Anastasia. Yeah, uh, so we'll, we'll uh, make sure that you're able to hear the questions. Also. Thank you. Uh, either um, you can come up and uh, speak into the microphone or into the screen, or I can translate the questions as well. Please. I think I was, if I can respond. Uh, it is a kind of perennial question regarding the, uh, Anski's Yiddish writings. And to make sure that everybody heard it, or to make sure that I understood the question completely, the question has to do with the flatness of Anski's Yiddish. Was this a deliberate strategy on Anski's part, or was it just a betrayal of the fact that he just didn't write Yiddish that well? I think we have to be uh, nuanced about this. He certainly does not write with the poetic richness and density that Peret or Sholem Alechem write with in Yiddish. Um, Anski was very close personally and ideologically to Peret. He actually didn't care much for, for Sholem Alechem as a person or as a writer. I think that this flatness that I'm referring to connects with, uh, with what I'm describing as the difference between an allegorical imagination and a metaphorical imagination. Uh, Haggis's writing is densely metaphorical in a way that I'm describing the destruction of Galicia as an allegorical kind of work. In a sense, this is deliberate, and I want to contend why for two reasons. 
One reason why is because when Anski was training himself as a Russian writer in the 1880s and the 1890s, his ultimate goal was to provide didactic reading material for Russian peasants who had only recently acquired literacy. And his feeling was, you have to tell simple stories for simple readers, whether we agree with that strategy or not. There's an element of didacticism, an element of willful simplifying that continues to characterize Anski's Russian language writing about Jewish study, about Jewish subjects in the first part of the uh, in the 1890s and the first part of the 20th century. When Anski wants to speak a sophisticated Yiddish, for example, in that Dybbuk, his Yiddish can be just as dense and just as complicated and just as eloquent as Peretz's Yiddish is. And that Dybbuk is a better play than any of the plays that Peretz wrote. He believed that Yiddish needed to be a flat language in order to reach the entire mass of uh, Yiddish readers. He didn't want to be an elite writer. He wanted to be a popular writer. And I think that that is one of the reasons that accounts for the flatness of Anski's Yiddish. Another reason, and you allude to this in your question, Anski took all of his notes for everything that he wrote, the destruction of Galicia included, in Russian. And he translated them back into Yiddish for this work specifically. So there's an element of the destruction of Galicia that reads like a translation even in the original language, or if you will, the translation of a work that never had an original language. And that also contributes to this feeling of flattening the literary language, I think. student of Peret Schumle in Wroclaw, for a year and a half there. I'm curious to know if the school still exists and if who goes to that school. And by the same token, how many Jews are there presently in Wroclaw who might be attending your lectures? Uh-huh. Uh, this has been a subject of ongoing fascination for me. Uh, as far as I understand, and I invite you to elaborate on your experiences in Wroclaw, this is fascinating to me. Wroclaw was really only a center for Polish Jews for a very short time, really at the end of the 1940s. Um, speaking about the geography of Wroclaw, originally Wroclaw was part of Germany, it was called Breslau. It becomes Polish territory for the first time, or you know, the first time in 400 years, or however you want to define it, only after 1945. And it becomes Polish territory through the expulsion of the German population, which had been thoroughly Nazified. So Polish Jews arrive in 1946 in Wrocław. Uh, uh, they're newcomers. They're not the Jews who had lived in Breslau in the 19th century. And the significance of Wrocław to the Polish Jewish survivor community was very brief, really only a couple of years. As far as I know, there's no Pagat Shula or any other kind of Jewish educational institution in Wrocław you know, beyond the department that I teach in at the university. There is a Jewish community. There's a synagogue. I go to the synagogue every Friday night. There are services. There's a meal. There are a lot of very friendly, very uh, lovely people. However, it is very unusual that the rabbi is an Israeli. He's Orthodox. The, the liturgy, the, the service is Orthodox. There is very seldom a Jewish minion because most of the people who attend services are not considered halachically Jewish. So it's a very, very interesting phenomenon in terms of what brings these people to uh, a, a, a Jewish synagogue. Is it that they have a Jewish parent or a Jewish grandparent or a Jewish feeling or they want to become Jewish or they don't want to convert to Judaism? 
it, it varies from person to person, but it's a very lively community, even if it can't be defined as a halachically consistent community. So that's my experience of the community. I do get Jewish students as well as non-Jewish students in my classes. I don't really ask them at the beginning of the semester. So, are you Jewish? And, you know, uh, it's a it's a literature class. It's not a chabad, but you know, uh, 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 I recognize that there are both Jews and non-Jews in my classes. And remarkably, these classes are very well enrolled. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I teach Yiddish language and I teach Yiddish literature in translation and the Yiddish literature in translation is a very bizarrely postmodernist experience because I'm lecturing in English and oftentimes, although not exclusively, the students are reading in Polish. So, a little bit weird. But when I teach in Yiddish, I teach in the Yiddish language and the students respond to me in the Yiddish language. And these students, whether they're Jewish or not, have been very, very well, well schooled in speaking Yiddish. It's so very it's, impressive. So Yiddish becomes more universal then, you know. It does, and I want to add that my courses are as, proportionally speaking, they are as well enrolled in Wrocław, where there are very few Jewish people, as they are in places like Baltimore or New York City or New Haven, where there are a lot of Jewish people. So. It's interesting. I have to add as an aside that Wroclaw uh, University um, has a good reputation, especially in Eastern and Central Europe, uh, for the strength of its Jewish studies department. And correct me if I'm wrong, but. Uh, I, 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 I correct you because you're right. Uh, <laughs> this is one of my attractions to work there. I think it's not just one of the best. I think for Central and Eastern Europe, it's really the best. Yeah. For, for modern Jewish studies, it's mm -hmm. really the best place to be working. And it's very exhilarating to uh, develop a relationship with my colleagues, both Jewish colleagues and non-Jewish colleagues, working in history, working in literature, working in uh, linguistics and uh, ethnography. It's a very lively center for Jewish studies. Do we have more questions? It's the located on kind of a uh, an island. Uh, people call Wrocław the Venice of the north. It's a it's a series of rivers and canals, so everything's on islands. It's very picturesque. The town of Wrocław is in the very northwestern corner of Poland. It's closer to Berlin than it is to Warsaw. And it's a city of about a million people. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's the fifth largest city in Poland which is something that I had no idea about when I first arrived there. I was, uh, I was amazed at three things. I was amazed at the size of the city, and I was amazed at the beauty of the architecture, particularly the Old Town Square, which has been very lovingly uh, renovated. And I was also surprised because it was Poland that everything wasn't in black and white. You know, I never really thought that Poland had colors because all I knew about Poland was from the photographs I saw from 100 years ago, and they were never in color. More questions? Yeah. Uh, in the end of that book that uh, Lansky describes, the Jews conscripted into the various uh, countries' armies, and if so, what impact did they have on the Russian Holocaust? Mm -hmm. So the question was um, uh, regarding the book. Whether Jews were conscripted to uh, various armies, and if so, what impact uh, this had, and what was going on? So this is a really interesting question. I would say, by and large, uh, there is relatively little attention paid either to the fact that Jews were in fact serving in the army, or that for the first time in really large numbers large numbers of Jews were fighting against one another on opposite sides of the war. That had never really happened before World War I, and that's, that's an interesting political uh, uh, subject. It's not something that Anzi himself devotes a great deal of attention to. He's really more focused on 
the way that the war effort impacts the civilian Jewish population, particularly in the persecutions, in the pogroms, in the way the Jews are perceived anti-Semitically, uh, the conspiracy theories, as I've talked about at great length, although I could have talked about it longer, you know, it's a very big book, it's full of these uh, stories. Uh, that's more of the focus, and I think that there's something to be said, perhaps, about the way that Anski falls back on a kind of conventional typology, in the sense that I think the Jews coming out of the 19th century were extremely uncomfortable with the idea that Jews would serve a, a, as military soldiers, as Jews would be killing other people. I think that's a very awkward role for Jews of Anski's generation to uh, inhabit. So he doesn't spend a great deal of time on that. The place to find that is in Babel's Red Cavalry. But of course, Babel's Red Cavalry is talking about a very different army from the armies that Anski is describing. And Babel identifies with Red Cavalry, with the, with the Red Army, in the hopes that Bolshevism will erase the invidious differences between Jews and non-Jews. And it's a very delicate dramatizing act that Babel does. For Anski, he's not interested in what happens to the soldiers, because the soldiers, by definition, have power. He's interested in describing what happens in warfare to the people who don't have power. And that's where his focus rests. Thank you. More questions? So the question is that uh, there are a couple examples in the book. Uh, there is an example of a Jewish soldier who hears um, another uh, soldier uh, cry out Shema Israel, and he gets upset, you know, within the battle um, that you know there is this violence uh, against another Jew. Well, this is much discussed throughout the Jewish world during World War I, not just by Nansky. This is something that, that a lot of people were grappling with. The other side of that, though, because Nansky is a very schematic writer, he writes about uh, conspiracy theory among the Russians. Uh, some of the Russian officers had German names. And one of the conspiracy theories that was going on around was that one of the Russian army officers with a German name had a brother who was a, a, an army officer for the, for the German a, a, a army. And they would get together every night and compare strategies and trade secret information for one another. So this is the counterpart to the legend that you're, you're describing about the Jewish soldier hears a, a soldier from the other army crying out Shema Yisrael. The mirror function of different armies opposing one another has both positive and negative uh, uh, connotations in the in the in the framework of the of, of this narrative. Thank you. Um, Vilnius is a large place. Um, I mean, geographically, were there parts of Galicia where the pogroms and the anti-Semitism were worse? Did it have to do with the little devils as opposed to the the shtetl, You know, the shtetl? But how, how did that work? That's all. Like it, we describe it as the destruction of Galicia. And I'm just wondering if there's a more uh, specific version of what happened where, you know? Were you able to get that? Okay. I did get that, yeah. The, the answer to that question is relatively simple. The destruction happened wherever the Russian army was. That what Anski is describing from the perspective of a representative of the Russian government is the destruction that the Russian army was, uh, uh, was uh, showering on the Jewish population. Now, a friend of mine, the historian Jeff Weinlinger, is working on a book, I believe the book is probably gonna come out very soon, 
this is going to be an amazing historical revelation. My friend, Professor Weidlinger, look at the geography of pogroms during and immediately after World War I. And he compared them against the largest atrocities of the Einsatzgruppen at the beginning of World War II, at the beginning of the Holocaust in the summer of 1941. It matches up to an uncanny degree. Wherever there had been pogroms during and immediately after World War I, that's where the Einsatzgruppen were most active in killing Jews in uh, early 1941-1942. So that's the short answer. Uh, uh, not every area of Galicia was affected equally, but where there was fighting among Austrians and Russians, that's where the Jews got the worst of it. And it's, uh, 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 it, it, it can be mapped out chronologically because the front shifts from 1914 to 1915 to 1916 to 1917, and the violence gets worse as the war continues. Thanks. Any more questions? No? Well, um, if not, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for uh, such a wonderful lecture and very timely lecture in, in our age as well, in our age of post-truth, to talk about conspiracy theories um, and the Jewish perspective um, and the Yiddish perspective, right, as well. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be closing with this. Thank you all for coming.